many, many areas that were missed tonight. There's many praise reports that may have uh, taken place that we didn't hear. But, Lord, we thank you and praise you for all, each and every one of them. And I ask, Lord, now that you would uh, teach us through the word. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. Uh, so y'all got the memo. No Wednesday night next week. <laughs> uh, so the Bible teaches, and, and you'll find this, I think, uh, in the beginning of, um, of Joshua life where he was teaching the people and he was taking over for Moses. God had him always remind them of what God had done in their life. And so it's, it's important for us to remember. I know that, that preachers tend to, well, they're going to lean on salvation all the time because this is the main theme that God's come uh, to the earth for is to save people. So, but to look at where you could have been tonight. I mean, I know you're in church and you're sitting in, uh, you're in Flint, Texas, and you're just in a small setting here and you're thinking it's just church. But, you know, if God hadn't entered into your life, some of you could be sitting in prison. Some of you could be sitting in, well, yeah, the club. Some of you could be dead. I mean, really. And it's amazing what God has done in our life. And so every once in a while, you need to look back. And I, I, think, I think often with me, I kind of look back every day and realize, man, where God's carried me to, where I come from, what could have happened. And so... I just remember God's blessings. And, and so in Isaiah 64, uh, <clears throat> matter of fact, uh, I got a heading here on my notes. The remnant praise. What's a remnant? A few. That's what we are tonight. We're a few. The remnant praise. You know, God's people may not, as I've mentioned to you several times, I mean, unless you, get, unless you got it all figured out, there may not be but 2 to 3% of the entire population of the world that are truly God's people. And that might be pushing it. And so here we are. We're, we're on the verge of the rapture of the church. And, and uh, you know, in some areas, yeah, people are going to miss. There's going to be a, quite a few more raptured out of here. But so, there's some areas, folks, that won't even miss them. India. They got every God there is to have over there. And folks, they, they ain't going to miss the Christians. There ain't going to be that many of them. Unless, um, now, unless there's some great revival going on that I don't know about. And, and so the reason why I'm saying that is that the few that are gods, we need to be praying. Praying even, if there's such a thing as praying harder, longer, more persistent with the Lord, then that's what we need to do. We need to be like that persistent widow. We need to keep coming to God, coming to God, and say, Lord, do this work. And then we need to be open for when he asks us to do it or ask us to speak, to, to not have the sin of silence taking place in our life, but to speak. We need to be pushing uh, the kingdom of God as hard as we can because our days are short. So, the remnant prays in verses 1 through 4, God's people plead for him to come in power and glory. They plead for that. I'm pleading for that. But at the same time, I'm pleading also for God to save. Because, you know, when you stop and think about where you're at, where you were, where you're at today, and where you could have been today, you could have been already in the grave or you could have been still going down, down, down. As Johnny Cash says, that burning ring of fire. You can keep going down now. And you know, God saved you. And so now, you're looking for that power and glory of God, but you are also got friends that don't know Jesus. I'm sorry, that's just the way it is. You got friends that don't know Jesus, and, and you wouldn't want them to end up in eternity without God. That's a long time. <clears throat> so, here he goes. Oh, that you would rend the heavens in other words you would come down you mean god you would come down 
Now, Isaiah is prophesying to the future. And we're experienced it. We're on the other side of the cross. We know what took place on Calvary. God did come down. And, you know, I hear, the, I hear, I understand the, the phrase, pray heaven down. Well, what you're wanting to do is, uh, what they're saying is pray God's will. Pray for God's will to have it, it, its place on earth as it does in heaven. And so when you talk about the fact that God, that you would come down, this is his second comment here in explanation mark, that you would come down, that the mountains may shake at your presence and the fires burn brushwood. Let me go back to that mountain shaking for a minute. Where in the Bible does it talk about the mountain shook? Come on. Y'all read your Bible now. We've been talking about studying your Bible. There are several places in the Bible where mountains shook. And Moses went up. Sinai. God shaking that mountain. <laughs> you know, if you ever want to be sometimes in a place to see the looks on people's faces, you know, you, you probably said a comment before, I'd like to have been a fly on the wall when that conversation took place and see how they responded. But what about if you had been a fly on the mountain and you can see the people of Israel down there in this mountain shaking. That don't happen every day. That's like, you know, something's going on here that's beyond, beyond. And so this is talking about the presence of God coming down. When, when you had Sinai event where God come down on the mountain, met Moses, we're shaking a mountain. I mean, the presence of God folks, is going to, going to shake things. And when Jesus comes back, yeah, the earth is going to change. It's going to shake things, no doubt. And so, you know, but here we have the Lord coming back for us. And, and Isaiah's talking about a presence that takes place in the future, but we're going to experience that. As the fire burns the brushwood, as the fire causes water to boil, to make your name known to your adversaries, God's got an enemy? Yeah. Now let me ask you a question so you get your theology on right tonight. Who's God's enemy? Who? Everything that, and everyone that rejects God. That's God's enemy. Now who's his primary enemy? Satan. Now let me ask you a question. Who created who? Get you you got to think about this a minute. God created Satan. Is he equal to God? No. Is he even a hundredth equal to God? No. Is he a God? No. And, and I, can't, I can't get over the idea sometimes Christians will think that, that the, the devil, because of good and evil, that the devil's an equal power. He's not. Matter of fact, when you get to heaven, you're going to look at him. And God's going to, now, don't ask me how all this event it says that you, you'll be able to see the one that tempted you or accused you. And you're going to say, he? Well, you'll have the mind of Christ at that point, but you're going to say, he? But here on this side, we believe, you mean, it was him that messed with me? I, I, could over, I could take him. Now, be it, I need to say it this way. We fight a spiritual warfare down here. We really do. The enemy throws a lot of fiery darts at you. And what are you to do? What does Ephesians, what does Paul tell you to do? Hold up that shield of faith. That's what's it going to do? It's going to extinguish the darks, and you can you can resist the devil. You can do that. This is what the Bible says. And what do you do when you resist the devil? Not only do you resist him, you're going to draw close to someone else. And who is that? God. And then what is the devil going to do when he sees you're resisting him and you're drawing close to God? Is he going to go over there and? 
and take on God? Now we're going to find out Sunday morning. And some of you are going to miss it. We're going to find out Sunday morning that he goes to heaven and he takes on God. And we know that in these verses, you can read chapter 12 of Revelation, God says, Michael, and that's an archangel, will you take some angels and will you go and put an end to this thing? And Michael did. Kicked his tail and sent him back to earth. And his third of the fallen angels went with him. Now let me tell you something. He's mad then. He's really mad. He'd been kicked out of heaven. I want to tell you, yeah, again, that's right. This time, this time's different. You know why it's different? He's not allowed to go back. In the Old Testament, when he was removed from heaven, and you read the story of Job, it says the, the enemy or the devil and the sons of God appeared before God. Remember that? And then God's the one that brought Job to his, his attention. Well, he's not going to be able to go back to heaven. It's going to be all over for him. Now, what does the Bible say? The Bible says his days are numbered, and he knows his time is short. Folks, he realizes, i got three and a half years. Do as much damage as I can do. He's mad. He's done been beat. He's coming back to the earth. He's going to take it out on whom? Anybody that believes in God, number one, and then everybody else because they're still God's creation. So he takes it out on all of mankind. That's called the Great Tribulation. So I'm just telling you, um, to make known your adversaries that the nations may tremble at your presence, they're going to tremble one day. When they going to tremble? At the second coming. They're going to tremble. Israel will, will mourn. Oh my, oh my, we missed it. It was he. We, what, what have we been believing all this time? We had the Messiah. So they're going to mourn. All the nations are going to tremble at your presence. Now, I, I, I do believe in a millennial reign that Christ will be ruling out of Jerusalem and all the nations will be serving under him. Who's left of that? I don't know. I mean, we'll get to that theology later on. But, but then you did an awesome things for which we did not look. You came down, the mountain shook at your presence, for since the beginning of the world, men have not heard nor perceived by ear nor has seen by nor has the eye seen any God besides you. Any God. What's that telling you? No others. No others like God. Who acts for the one who waits for him. Um, okay, so so uh, let me ask you a question. When the Bible teaches you to wait upon the Lord. How do you take that? What are you going to do? What are you going to do when the, the Bible teaches you sometimes just to wait upon the Lord? The Bible teaches you sometimes to be patient. The Bible teaches you all these areas. What does it mean to you? Trust. Trust. Stand on the word. You pray more. You seek God more. You're not actually waiting like you just, we do enough of that every day. It's seeking God. It's, it's continue to stand on his word. Continue to believe him. When all else looks like it's fall away, you stay with God. You wait on God. You don't go nowhere. You stay in the camp. And what I mean by that is you don't look anywhere else either. You only look to one. You know, I think that Christians sometimes when we have our our problems in life is when we see them come in sometimes and start our problems and we start trying to solve them when we should wait on the Lord and we should carry them before the Lord and let him take care of business. And what we try to do is sometimes we try, I do it, I try to solve my own problems and God says, well, you're not listening to me. Trust 
And uh, what can you do? What can you do on your own? Really, what can you do as a human being? When you have all these spiritual problems in your life, how are you going to win those battles if you don't go to the Lord? You won't. How are you going to, you know, let's just be honest. When, when someone goes to the doctor and the doctor says, you know, I'm sorry, you only got six months to live. You think you're going to fix that problem? No. You can't. And, you know, the thing about it is sometimes what we do, we, so, we get so self-dependent and so reliant on our own rely on our own knowledge and our own ways and our, in life. And, and we should carry, and, and, and you're not going to wear God out, and you're not going to bother God here. Y'all ever heard that phrase? I don't want to bother you. I had people tell me this. I, they, as a minister, they'd call me up and go, I know you're busy, I don't want to bother you. That's their first statement. I know you're busy, I don't want to bother you. You're not bothering me. I'm telling you that. I'm being honest with you. You're not bothering me. Folks, I'm in this with you. If we bother, if it bothers you that you're to call somebody and say, will you pray for me? I know I'm bothering you, but come on. This is the Christian life. I need the church. You need the church. Just so happens that God bless you. I'm the pastor of the church and bless your heart you're in trouble there but but you're not bothering me and, and you know what um, I, you're not going to bother God I sometimes think like that I, I get that small mind thinking that well, you know the Lord doesn't care about you know this little small thing in life I'll take care of this I don't need to bother him with it and what do we do? Sometimes we make a mess of it. I think sometimes God just kind of plays with us. I shouldn't say it like that. But I think he kind of, you know, like the time I told you on several occasions, somebody lost their keys in the backyard of the church, and there's a pretty good-sized backyard. We're all back there. Everybody's got their flashlight and their light on their phone out, and we're looking in the grass for these little set of keys, and and we got 20 people out there. And so statistically, we got 40 eyeballs looking. And we ought to find those keys. And we wasn't having any uh, luck, as they say, finding those keys. And I think it was Deborah, it may have been her sister, I forgot who it was. Has anybody prayed? That was the question. Has anybody prayed? Well, no, we don't want to bother God with that little thing. You know, he's going to, he's got bigger things to do over there. He's got, he's got the devil to contend with, and the, which is nothing for him. You understand the God you serve. And then what do we do? We finally come to the reason we're not going to find these keys. So now, last resort, let's pray. We prayed, and the minute we said amen, somebody said, here they are. And I think God's kind of up there sometimes in heaven going, oh, my people. I'm going to let them wander around that yard for a while. One of them will come to their senses in a minute. One of them will finally come to their senses, and they did. Have we prayed? Have we prayed? And then we find it. You know, God allows that to happen. Remember the prodigal son? So I'll just get my earnings. I'll go live my life the way I want to. I'm going to lead my life on my way, God. Have it my way. Who sung that song? Uh, ben Crosby, was it? Whoever. I'll have it my way. And then Elvis Presley did. I said, I'll do it my way. That's what it was. Well, you know how that ends up. In front of prodigal son, where did he end up at? In the pig pen. He could have ended up in the... Sheep pen, that would have been better. But there's an illustration there to, huh? What'd you say? They were Jewish. I know. I, 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 there's always a meaning behind everything. 
He was in the pig pen. Pig pen considered to be, pig was considered to be, you know, what do you call it, uh, not unclean. And, and you're out there eating slop with them. And then you come to your senses. You know, it's kind of like that old Ford advertisement they had way back in the day. Some of you may remember it. The light came on. Ding! I come to my senses. God's there. Now, how many, I'm going to ask you a simple question. How many days do you figure out a year's time? Let's think about this. That you live your life not even acknowledging God in a day. You hope none. But how many times have you just thought, hey, I'm not going to bother God with this. I can do this. You see, it's not that you can't do little things. It's that everything you do in life, I think, is uh, by design. I really do think it's by design. Somebody told me the other day, like the scripture, it says, whatever you find your hands to do, do it with all your might, do it as of the Lord, right? Okay, so I was told by someone that was working that you're doing this for God. I'm not doing it for the employer. I'm doing it for God. So how does that change the job? No, no, so what does God get? Does God get the very least or does he get the very best of us? Does God get just a portion or does he get all of us? Something to think about here a minute. Should I give God all of me or just a little bit of me? When I got saved, I gave him all of me. And somewhere along the ways, I took back about 50%. If y'all understand what I'm trying to say, my life began. Well, I'll let, you know, I'm going to let God lead it here because I need to get saved. But now, as I walk this journey with the Lord, I need to be giving him much more. Uh, fellowship. Fellowship. The obstacle of God's great works. Here's our problem. Is our sin. Uh, you meet him who rejoices and does righteousness, who remembers you in your ways. You are indeed angry, for we have sinned. In these ways we continue, and we need to be saved. Yep. But we are all like an unclean thing, and all our righteousness are like filthy rags. We all fade as a leaf, and our iniquities, like wind, has taken us away. And there is no one who calls on your name, who stirs himself up to take hold of you. For you have hidden your face from us and have consumed us because of our iniquities. Now, Isaiah is saying this. You know what will separate? Now, let me, once again, I want to make sure you understand me tonight. I'm a guy that believes in once saved, always saved. What does that mean? That simply means that once I call upon the Lord Jesus Christ and he says, you shall be saved, he will not reverse that thought. In other words, I will, I'll always be him, his. I was adopted into the family of God. I'm grafted into the vine, and God's not going to remove that. When Paul says, I'm, I'm convinced neither half nor death nor this nor that, all these things can separate you from the love of God. When Jesus said, those father that you gave me and put, uh, placed them in my hand, no one will snatch them out. No, no way will you lose your salvation. But what happened to Christians, I'm going to talk about a genuine relationship, a genuine change, a transformation took place, the fruit on the tree. Remember that. Jesus said, you'll know the tree by its fruit. If Christians don't have fruit on their tree, then maybe they're not Christian. Okay? We with that? So, putting all that together, the one thing that gets us in trouble the most with God is when we commit a sin. And for the unrighteous, for the ones that are lost, it was the sin that separated you from God. It was the sin that you were waddling in when love lifted you up. 
while you were yet sinners. Don't forget it. While you were let yet sinners, Christ died for you. So now when we, when we wake up out of this unrighteousness into the fact of who God is, and we give him our life, and we can repent of our sins, and we move forward with God, life gets better. It does. It gets better for the relationship, the spiritual relationship. Life in this body, I can't tell you how it changes much. I think the, I think the Christian comes to the idea that God's in control of his entire life, so something happens in his body, he just gives that to God and says, Lord, heal me, and if the Lord, you don't heal me, and I go home to be with Jesus, I still win. Mm -hmm. no. Come on, right? Uh, so why do we think we're going to live forever? I mean, why do we think we're going to live forever down here? Why do we think that? Why would you want to? <laughs> I, I'll tell you a thought I had. And, uh, maybe you have the same thoughts, maybe you're different. I hope you're different. But I was thinking, I was talking to somebody today. Matter of fact, I was talking to my, my son, and, and uh, we was talking about, we was coming back from eating lunch. And somehow or another, we got on the fact that men, are, men and women are living longer today. So the average death now today is uh, that, that has been raised up, I think, to 77, 78, 80, somewhere in there. It was down low. You remember back in World War II, it was like 55 to 60, and it's come up throughout the years. Now, it's up there close to 80. Let's just call it 80 for a minute. And all of us in here that's under 80, we think we got until 80. <laughs> and some of us have more. <laughs> and some of us have more. Okay, the bonus years. Bonus years. The bonus years. Woo, the bonus years. So, so, you know, you get to thinking like, I got until 80. Well, how far is that away? Not far. But that's not what the Bible says. Let's go back to what the Bible says. How, how much time do you have? I know you have eternity from the spiritual sense. I know you're going to die and go be with the Lord. That's, that's great. That's good news but what God determines. And uh, last time I looked in the word of God, he wasn't cluing us in on what day that is or what year that is. He has said, I think I love this about God. He said to Joshua, Joshua, you're old. Joshua was 120. <laughs> so, you know, if you live then, you think, hey, I'm going to, have a hunt. I'm gonna live to be 120 like Joshua. No, God said no. God, and, and Pastor Dill's right. You don't know. God got your days, and when they come up, folks, there's nothing you can do about it. I made a statement Sunday morning. Some of you wasn't here. I want you to think about it a minute. God will take you home when He's done with your testimony. God will take you home when he's done with your testimony. Think about this a minute. How do they overcome in Revelation? By the word of the lamb and blood of the lamb. I'm sorry. Blood of the lamb and the word of their testimony. And love their lives, what? Not unto death. Yeah, in other words, if you died, fine. Dying for God. I challenge you guys sometimes to study some of these old saints. Um, one of my favorites is Polycarp. I love that story. Just love that story. I get to die for God today. I mean, can you get that one around your mind for a minute? I get to die for God today. I get to have a testimony. And I'm going to follow him all days of my life, no matter what. And you know what? The one thing that hinders this this fellowship with God is sin. And for the Christian, it hinders our fellowship. For the unbeliever, it keeps us separated. And so I'm just going to tell you tonight, um, 
I think I included this in my prayer life here recently. I don't know where it came from. I just started adding it. Lord, help me not to fall. Now, when it's talking about falling, uh, not physically. Help me not to fall. Help me not to sin against thee. Now, what did, is it okay to pray that? Yes. Open my eyes, God, so I won't be drawn away from you. Let me keep my eyes fixed on you. And I'm just telling you, there's so many things in this world, and we had, and I'll conclude with this thing here. I know I, know I got you over a little bit, but I'm going to, you've heard this scripture many, many, many times mentioned. You've heard pastors talk about our righteousness is the filthy rags. Y'all know what that means, right? I'm talking to the choir here. You know what filthy rags determine the, the yeah. In the days of old, anything that came out of the body, wherever it came out of the body at, was considered defiled. Anything. And then he, when he, the writer's saying here, when Isaiah using this filthy rag, we know that's, that's basically, I don't even want to go there, but you know what that is. It's still coming out of the body and it's very defiled. And so when he's saying to us before we become Christians that our righteousness was as filthy rags, meaning we were defiled all the way, folks. I mean, there wasn't a speck of righteousness in you. There wasn't anything you could hang on to and say to God, this part's right. You were totally defiled. And, and I think what you need to understand, some people, I just want to make this, this out, put this out there a minute. Because I used to think I'm not that bad of a guy. But when you look at, when you go back and you look at it, and you look at what God saved you from, you were totally defiled. You were totally, there was nothing righteous in you. And when God saved you, Oh, praise the Lord. Amen. Praise the Lord. Your life changed. So why do I want to do the things that God wants me to do? Why do I want to do them? Answer that. Why do I want to do them? Why do you want to do them? That's right. I love God. God loved me first. Poured out his love on me. I love him now. Now I love my neighbor. Uh that's a challenge. But I love my neighbor. And you want to serve God. You know what I love about Grace Fellowship Church? I believe you folks are genuine. I really do. I believe you're the real deal. Now, the world is going to call you. Yeah, they're going to call you crazy. Because you believe in a God you can't see. You can't feel, you can't, you have a relationship with someone that you go, well, you know, you're hearing voices in your head, something's wrong with you. <laughs> That's what the world thinks. But you know what? One day, one day, that world's going to be shook. And they're going to realize, uh-oh. So it's up to us to go out and share. Anybody got any closing thoughts as we go to that? Have a good East Thanksgiving. Yeah. <laughs> I'm waiting for that trump to sound and God to step out on that cloud and come up here. That's what he did in Revelation. Come up here. 
You, well, wait a minute, God, I'm not finished with what I'm doing. Now you ain't going to say that. No. You're going to be ready to go. <laughs> Let me pray and we'll close. Thank you for coming tonight. Father, we praise you and thank you, Lord, for all that you do. Lord, you're just so good. God, you're just so good. And, and Lord, I thank you for every person in here that you saved, Lord, and changed. And I believe they're, I believe they're real, Lord. I believe they're a the genuine thing. And, Father, I, they're, they're, they're taking shape, Lord, just that we're all taking shape like the Son of God, that we're being changed into his likeness and character in all ways. And so, Father, I, it's, it's great. It's good. And, Lord, I pray as we go now that when we see someone that, as that Scripture just said, that's defiled, that's sinful, that's a sinner, Lord, let us think about where we were at. And then, Lord, let us, let us share the gospel in love because, Lord, it's by love that we were saved. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for all that you've done. Thank you for the amazing grace it took on my life and on the lives of these. Lord, thank you once again. We praise you. Lord, now let us go. Let us uh, fulfill your will. In Christ's name, amen.